Despite having the world's most powerful currency, the US has consistently imported more goods and services than their exports, leading to a trade deficit. This is posing a serious threat to the dollar's value, as inflation is at its highest in around 40 years. To combat this, on 16th of August 2022, Joe Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act. But what's the hype all about? Because researchers at the University of Pennsylvania have already done a Penn Wartham budget model analysis, clearly stating that the bill's impact on inflation is statistically zero, meaning that the Inflation Reduction Act will not actually reduce inflation in the near future. We will only see notable changes in inflation reduction after a decade or so. But you know what? The hype is not necessarily coming from economists. Majority of it is coming from environmentally conscious people. To the tens of millions of young Americans who have spent years marching, rallying, this bill is for you. The boldest climate package in U.S. history. And it's been a long time in coming. I will break the 700-page Inflation Reduction Act into three components, total revenue raised, total investments, and total deficit reduction. As for the revenue part, the act aims to raise $737 billion. Where exactly is this money coming from? Yeah, you guessed it, taxes. More specifically, from things like a 15% corporate minimum tax through prescription drug reform by allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices with pharmaceutical companies, as well as providing additional IRS funding which is supposed to increase revenue collection. After the $737 billion is raised, $437 billion will go into investments and the remaining $300 billion will be used to reduce the deficit. But the million dollar question here, or should I say a billion dollar question here, is that is $300 billion enough to cover for USA's deficits? When Joe Biden became the president, the trade deficit over the next 10 years was expected to be $14.5 trillion and the IRA will raise taxes to reduce only $300 $300 billion, or 2% of borrowed money over the next 10 years. In other words, the US would need 50 more such bills to not have any debt by the end of this decade. So this makes me wonder, what is the true agenda behind this bill? To answer this, we have to look at it from the investment side of things. The $437 billion for investments will be allocated to address energy security, to make healthcare more affordable, and towards drought resiliency in the western parts of United States of America. However, this allocation is not uniform. It looks something like this. 84%, which is around $369 billion, are used to address energy security and climate change, making the Inflation Reduction Act the single largest investment on climate change and energy in American history. That's why many people, including myself, as you probably might have guessed from the title of this video, saying that this is essentially just a climate bill under a different name. Words matter, names matter, said the director of George Mason University's Center for Climate Change Communication. Inflation and price of gas are top of mind concerns for most Americans today. So calling the bill the Inflation Reduction Act was a stroke of rhetorical genius. I mean, he's not wrong because USC has a history of failed climate bills, like the Climate Stewardship Act of 2003, which became the Climate Stewardship and Innovation Act after being reintroduced two years later. And by 2009, the bill became referred to as the American Clean Energy and Security Act. In order for the act to stay relevant, the word climate had to be kept out of its title because most of the public did and still does place a higher priority on other issues, especially economic security. When Thomas Edison built America's first coal-fired electric generating station in New York City, coal was already on its way to becoming the country's top energy source. And by 1980, more than half of America's electricity was driven from burning fossil fuel. Now, thanks to this bill, America is ready to move on. But why now? Why didn't the US realize this earlier? In 1988, climate scientist James Hansen testified in front of the US Senate that greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate. But there was no response. Or when in 2005, when US peaked their CO2 emissions, there was no response. 
To understand why the response is coming right now, take a look at this graph. It's about the price increases in the US from April 2021 to 2022. As you can see, fossil fuel prices are rising faster than any category. And this is not even the whole picture. Fossil fuels are also responsible for increased prices in other areas because so many of the goods we buy are produced and transported using fossil fuels. This is bad during times of inflation. And as fossil fuel prices were rising, renewable energy prices were getting cheaper by the day. As per the IPCC report on the mitigation of climate change, the price of solar has dropped by 85% and wind energy by 55%. You know, at the time, if you could get a wind farm that costs less than $100 a megawatt hour, which is like triple the normal electricity rate, mm -hmm. that was a great deal. Yeah. And solar was 10 times the cost of normal, you know, power from a gas plant. But over the last decade, we've taken these, what we used to call expensive alternative energy technologies, right. and now they are cheap, trillion dollar mainstream you know technologies that are yeah. scaling rapidly this makes it the absolute perfect time to make this transition towards renewable energy and to simplify how the 369 billion dollars will be distributed to tackle climate change let's use these blocks there are 369 blocks in total each one representing a billion us dollars a significant portion of the money is going towards driving down the cost of renewable energy including wind solar and grid scale batteries the whole point of this bill is to make the united states of america into a center of the clean technology Technology revolution, but America can't make it happen because most of the renewable energy devices, like solar panels, are imported from China. That's why the bill encourages the manufacture of renewables through tax credits. The next portion of the bill goes towards keeping nuclear power plants running. Then we have money going towards helping people to make more greener investments. If you go electric with your home appliances, you get some money back. Invest in rooftop solar, heat pumps, water heaters from renewable sources, get tax credits. Buy a new or used electric vehicle, get money at the point of sale. Lastly, we have a significant portion for things like greener agricultural practices, running public transport on electricity, building charging stations for electric vehicles, tax incentives for power plants to capture their emissions, building an extensive network of transmission lines, and funds for protection and restoration of forests. All of this just seems perfect, right? But did you know that a significant contributor of this bill was a senator who became a millionaire from his family's coal business? He has taken more campaign cash from the oil and gas industry than any of his colleagues have. Now, it might be that he has changed his heart towards more sustainable practices, but we should be careful considering the kind of history that he has had with the fossil fuel industry. Because despite making the single largest investment to address climate change, the US is far from eliminating fossil fuel consumption. Instead, the bill allows tax credits for carbon capture technology that could allow coal and gas burning power plants to keep operating with just lower emissions. The senator also secured a promise from Democratic leaders to speed up the process of issuing permits for projects like a natural gas pipeline in West Virginia. If this continues, what about the pollution and toxic wastewater that is released as a byproduct of burning fossil fuel? They can have a negative impact on the health of people who live close to these facilities, often including communities with low income and color. The bill also spends a huge amount of money on high-tech, unproven solutions like carbon capture, whilst very little money is going towards low-tech, but highly effective solutions like nature. Why should we pump money into technologies that would sequester carbon when we already have wetlands, prairies, and other landscape that do it for us? More money should have been spent on their maintenance and expansion, as it would also serve as a reminder for humans that taking care of the land has added benefits to wildlife as well as human health. I don't want to sound too critical about this bill, but I just want to provide you with a holistic perspective on things. Overall, I think we all can agree from an environmental standpoint that this bill is a significant step for the US to potentially transform the global energy economy. If all goes well, it will put America on a path to reduce 2005 emission levels by nearly 40% come 2030. And hopefully, it can positively impact the clean energy programs of other nations as well. And lastly, but certainly not the least, I want to thank all the people behind this, including scientists, policymakers, as well as the countless people who have volunteered to raise the voice for our planet's well-being. 
thank you for making this happen.